Hi, everyone. This is Lucia Hindorf. Welcome back from the break. Um, we are now going to do a very short overview of the breakout um, groups that we'll be meeting after the next panel. OK, I hope so. Um, so just to let everyone know, we are having a panel next. But after that, we would like everyone to break out into different breakout groups. And we thought we would give you just a quick little intro if, if you haven't done breakout groups in a while. So um, if you all go to the bottom of your Zoom media controls, you will see at the bottom of your screen a number of icons. When it's time to break out into the breakout groups, there will be a little pop-up that says breakout rooms and then join a breakout room. So you'll check that box when that icon appears. And then when the list of group appears, um, you'll find the group that you want to join and then click the join button, confirm your choice. And then that should put you in the Zoom room with the other people who are participating with your breakout group. Um, so. I'm gonna show you and just briefly walk you through the 14 groups that we plan to have. Um, here they are along with the individuals who have graciously agreed to be moderators for these. They'll be walking through um, the breakout group topic with you and um, get some good discussion going. And then the goal of every breakout group is to come up with one or two recommendations in that space to come out of this workshop. And it can be recommendations for the community. It can be recommendations for NIH, just um, whatever the group comes to consensus on. So just to walk through the breakout group options uh, very briefly, uh, please be thinking about which group you'd like to join. Group one is meta-analysis of legacy only genomic data. Group two is me meta-analysis of legacy plus non-legacy genomic data. Group three is looking at reference genomic resources. Group four is thinking about the necessity of non-genetically inferred labels and for which cases might uh, non-genetically inferred labels be necessary. Group five is prioritizing among, among pop multiple population descriptors, if there are multiple descriptors available within a study. Group six is defining um, other, which is a category we often seen in legacy data. Group seven is admixed populations. Group eight is tools for reusability and interoperability of legacy and non-legacy data. Group nine is technical approaches to assigning population descriptors. Um, so thinking about um, population descriptors using genetic data, genetically data-driven labels. Uh, group 10 is monitoring diversity or use of legacy data to uh, monitor, uh, population descriptors and legacy data to monitor diversity. Um, group 11 is avoiding misuse of labels. Group 12 is use of legacy data with ambiguous consent. Group 13 is changing existing population descriptor labels. And group 14 is community preferences. So hopefully that gives you a little taste of what is going to be in store. We hope everyone will be able to stay and actively participate in one of these groups. And so um, unless, are there any sort of brief Questions before we move on to the next yeah. hi, um, panel? Yes. Hi, hi Lucia. This is Esteban. Um, just this month, um, the FDA came out with a mandate of including diversity in all clinical trials. And that means that we're going to have to rely on labels. Out of the 14 of these, which one would be most relevant to the new FDA mandate? Oh gosh, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know the mandate. Sorry. Go ahead. My one will touch on that. It's it's yeah. when when do we have to use these non-genetically inferred labels? That's group number four. It, it, that's, which group is that? That's group five? The suggestion is group four, necessity four. of non-genetically inferred labels. That's perfect, Anna. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks so much. So I think we will now move on to um, the next session, which I will turn over to Jonathan King as the moderator. Thank you. Well, good afternoon from where I am. Uh, I'd like to talk uh, to you through this first panel, this panel on current challenges related to population descriptors and select contexts. We have three speakers, each of whom will have eight minutes. 
And after the three speakers have finished, we will have a robust amount of time for question and answer, Q&A. So please ask and direct your questions to there. So the first panelist today is Dr. Charles Rotimi, who is the scientific director of the National Human Genome Research Institute and the leading genetic epidemiologist and genomics researcher. Dr. Rotimi has contributed in the development of international genomic resources, including the HapMap, Thousand Genomes, and the African Genome Variation Project. He's also successfully led the establishment of the Human Heredity and Health Af Africa, H3 Africa Initiative, which created and supported a pan-continental network of labs applying leading edge research to the study of the genetic environmental bases of disease susceptibility and drug response in Africans. Dr. Rotimi. So again, thanks. And um, I've already learned a lot uh, from um, you know, the, uh, the talks before me, um, especially the uh, all of us. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, we are asked to address the challenges. Um, again, I think the first thing I want to just acknowledge um, is there are, no, there are no easy answers in this regard. And I think it's, uh, the, the, the issue is really contest, contest, contest. Uh, there are many reasons why we collect data and why we aggregate data. And we just need to be very careful and think, uh, you know, think about what is it that we want to do. I really like the response from Eric Bowwinkle about Sometimes we are too casual about the labels that we use, especially when we are training young men and women in our labs. So I, again, I think we just have to think about it. And I'm not here to give you sort of answers of best things to do, but just to challenge us um, you know, uh, going forward. So for example, in, <clears throat> data is collected and aggregated because of census data. I want to know the number of people in a particular country and how to use that information to allocate resources. Sometimes we want to understand the social determinants of health, um, especially for some of us who are very interested in health disparity. Uh, so that context becomes very important. And how do we properly aggregate people to make sure that we are capturing what the influence are? And diversity in genomics, how do we continue to monitor this to make sure that we can indeed engage everybody? Uh, and then using genetic ancestry um, you know, in terms of tracing our own ancestry, doing genetic research and medicine. Um, and I'll talk quite a bit about that uh, in the next few slides. Uh, because medicine is really interesting because medicine is a sample size of one. You are not treating a group. You are treating an individual in front of you. Um, and, and that can become very, very important. Next slide, please. So types of legacy data. Um, as you hear, heard in my introduction, I participated in the HAP map. One of the things that I, I will say, half map, in my opinion, represents the best example so far. I've been doing this now in almost 40 years. I, I, don't, I don't think I've seen something better than the half map uh, and the community engagement that I'll call within that umbrella. Uh, and then uh, I also reviewed recently the uh, uh, you know, Women's Health Initiative. I, I find their approach to be absolute, absolutely uh, great also, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And there are, you know, uh, legacy data where the consent is, is silent. Um, and then there are, you know, legacy data where the researchers are the one who has assigned labels. Um, and there are all, all of this involve different uh, challenges. Next slide, please. So this is the half map, uh, like, I, like I was saying. And what you, what you see in the half map is that we actually ask the people, and we talk very carefully about how we re, how would you like to be identified? How would you like, you know, for example, the Yoruba people in Nigeria, in Ibadan, Nigeria, we're absolutely very proud to be represented as the Yoruba, um, you know, from that part of the world. And, and, and you can see we didn't say Africa. Uh, we didn't, you know, we didn't even, you know, just, just say Nigeria. We, we were very specific, and it goes through all of this. Uh, even in Maasai, in, 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 you know, uh, you know, Kenya, uh, and Iluya, we were very specific. And to me, this is a labor that can stand the test of time uh, if we use it and use it. I, I know it may be problematic in certain areas and certain work that we do, but for me, this is absolutely uh, important. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and we also, <clears throat> 
made it very clear during the community engagement uh, that we are going to be stewards of the data that you send, and we are going to ensure that they are properly described and utilized following what you sign in your informed consent. Next slide. So this is what I was saying about the uh, Women's Health Initiative. Uh, again, this is a sort of a busy slide, but the point I want to make here is really that they were very, um, they were very aware that the labels that are being used are subject to things that happen in society and that those labels can indeed change. And therefore they make room that with time, they might have to revisit the labels that they are using. I think this is an approach uh, that I, you know, I, I respect quite uh, quite a bit. Next slide, please. And then the same thing you heard about the top men already this morning. Um, again, the top men, you know, use a lot of legacy data to aggregate and to do whole genome sequencing. Uh, but they were also very careful you know, to say, hey, if you are using this data, be aware that there are limitations in terms of self identity and the study criteria that was used to include and exclude people. And that talk may recommend distinguishing between genetically and not genetically inferred descriptions in analysis. Next slide, please. To me, this represents the biggest, most debated, you know, uh, legacy data, uh, you know, so far, and that is the AGDP. And the reason I think is highly contested and debated is that people felt like there was not really good, you know proper community engagement and therefore proper informed consent and, and transparency in all of that. Whether that is, you know, uh, something that we can fully support, you know, or, or articulate, I'm not sure, but it, it is indeed very controversial. But what is also important is that it's being used and it's being used all over the world, uh, you know, in a way. So how do we properly engage this? I, I heard that there is a, a movement to maybe use stop using the data, um, but we also have to look at the ethical implications of collecting data and then not using it and things like that. So next slide, please. Uh, please just click on several of these, I know I've run out of time, but the, the, the point I wanna make with this slide is that most of us, we truly don't have a good appreciation for our ancestral background. We know about the story that we are told so when we self-identify, we are relaying that story that we know or the way society have actually labeled us. Um, so this is a study that we did you know, from my lab, you know, um, and where we showed uh, using global population of about 6,000 individuals that the story of the world is admixture um, and multiple ancestry. Uh, and please, uh, two clicks. And so we showed the many part of these slides. Uh, so we find that there are 21 ancestries globally, but the important thing about ancestry is that because it's based on genetics, it's subject to evolutionary principles and it can change. So when somebody is using genetics to give you ancestry, that information is as robust as the reference that is being used and it can change that with time. And because it's evolutionary determined and genetics is subject to life and birth circles. And that's what we have to communicate. But the point here is that over 97% of these individuals from global population have mixed ancestry, and the average is for ancestry per individual. And again, we just need to be conscious of that. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this is something I just wanted to show in terms of African-American, uh, what we did in my lab, and we showed very clearly that um, uh, individuals uh, can indeed um, have very, very different ancestral background, but all everybody labeled as African-American, ranging from 0.6 to almost 100% of African ancestry with an average of 80%. You can see how that average can be very, very uh, you know, distorted. Next slide, please. And so group identity is confused with group ancestry. African-American do not reflect a single part of ancestry. And that's what we have to. So when we are using the concept of African-American, we have to be defining that uh, in a way uh, you know, that we can uh, justify next. And this is something we published recently that shows that one of the biggest problem that I have is that when we use European, we just see European as if European is not admixed. 
And we've shown that because of this thinking, you can actually arrive at a very wrong result if you don't properly take into consideration admixture in European population, where we show that after adjusting for both genome-wide and local-specific ancestry, association between highly differentiated variants in the LCT gene uh, with height and LDL were confirmed to be false positives. Uh, again, and we were able to do that because we defined a new reference uh, population. Next slide, please. And again, precision medicine, please just click on this so I can not take too much time. The precision medicine issue is really, like I said, when you are talking about precision medicine, you are talking about the individual. And there can be groups, but those groups are based on simple you know, accumulation of genetic variants that are important for that specific medicine that you are trying to apply to individuals. And when we are saying increased diversity in the context of precision medicine, we have to be very clear that we are not conflicting the issue of ancestry and population diversity with the notion of race. Next slide. And please tell me if I cannot continue, I don't want to take too much time, but this is an example from Africa. Um, and to just show how pharmacogenomics can indeed be highly distorted uh, because of the huge diversity across African populations. These two groups here, the Yoruba and the Maasai, uh, you know, about 600 miles apart, um, but they show very, very radical differences in, you know, uh, in the haplotype uh, frequency that is um, important for a reaction to have a cover uh, in terms of HIV treatment. The Maasai almost um, have the highest rate in the world, uh, about 14%, and it's almost absent among the Yorubas. It's about 1% in groups we call African-American. So when you look, look, use labels like African, Black, you render this radically different allele frequency invisible, and you can arrive at a very wrong public health decision. Next slide. And it's the same thing with um, you know, leukemia. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know, uh, Native American ancestry, uh, this was a study that I you know, was published in uh, 2011. I, I found it to be absolutely interesting. Again, this is not to label any group as carrying a, 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 a disease variant or anything like that. I always say we are all mutants. We are just mutants in our own way. And once we are able to recognize that globally, I think we will do a better job with genetics. But what it shows here, if you look at panel B, is that people who have, who carry a lot of Native American ancestry for this specific condition tend to have a higher rate of relapse uh, for, for leukemia. A phenomenon that physicians have you know, seen in a long time, but we're not able to explain why. But what was most important here is that by recognizing this and actually adding an additional dose of uh, chemotherapy, you can actually take care of this uh, increased relapse. Uh, again, very, very important. Next slide. And I want to end with this, that the context within which we are doing things is critically important. If you want to know what actually drive people towards poor health in a place like the United States or in Nigeria, or, I would say you have to think about bad government. You have to think about the location where people live. This is a study in the Chicago area that shows that just by living one football feet away, but you are living among whites uh, compared to people who call black, your life expectancy can be different up to 15 years. And this is not genetics. Genetics is not going to explain this because black people who live in white neighborhood, we are attaining the same sort of life expectancy uh, as, um, uh, as uh, uh, those whites in that community. So again, context is really important. How do we capture this in the data and legacy data that we are indeed capturing? Uh, next, and I think that's probably the last slide that I have. Uh, yes, and I'll be glad to take questions, see if I have any time left. Thank you, Dr. Atimi. As a noted, people will be answering their questions in the Q&A section uh, on Zoom. And then when we're at the end of the three speakers, we'll be addressing all the questions with the remaining time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is Dr. Kyle Brothers, who is an associate professor in the Departments of Pediatrics at the University of Louisville, where he's also affiliated with the Institute for Bioethics, Health Policy, and Law. 
He's a practicing primary care pediatrician and serves as a clinical ethics consultant at Norton's Children's Hospital. Dr. Brothers' research focuses on the ethics of genetic research and the translation of genomic techniques, technologies, I apologize, into clinical care. Thank you, uh, Dr. Brothers. Great, thank you so much. Um, I was asked to talk about social determinants of health uh, as a part of this wider discussion about population descriptors. Um, <clears throat> so one of the big challenges here is that legacy data often reflects outdated approaches to understanding the influence of social factors on health. Um, you know, uh, more modern um, data sets that are designed for secondary data use, like all of us, ABCD, um, et cetera, are, are probably not reflecting those same challenges. But when we sort of look at data that is, that's already, um, you know, it, it's already stored and we're sort of looking at it for secondary data use, the, you're gonna run into big challenges here. Um, it's fr frequently the case in these data sets that race and ethnicity are the only included social factors. There's not, the, the data was not originally designed to look at social factors. Often you'll see um, proxy variables like health insurance status, which itself often is not really describing what's happening, but is uh, many folks use it as a proxy for other factors. You also see um, variables that um, are important to understanding barriers to access, like LGBTQ plus status, disability, indigeneity, just not being included um, because of sort of changing views about the importance of these variables. And then you going going along with those, you get sort of broader, longstanding challenges that, uh, for example, limiting the inclusion in the data set of those who are well served by systems of care already. So those who are sort of presenting for healthcare and therefore were included in the data sets. Um, many of these data sets were collected in settings where, for example, an, an inclusion criteria was the ability to speak English and answer questions in English. Um, and then often these data sets are generated exclusively in urban centers uh, and academic medical centers, which sort of exclude rural populations. Um, and then you, you often see these data sets, uh, when they do have social determinants of health, they're drawn from low quality data sources like EHR. You even see uh, factors like race and ethnicity being drawn from EHR rather than self-report and therefore generating uh, low quality data. So I'm gonna talk a little bit in this talk about uh, low precision social determinants of health and then higher precision social determinants of health because I think it's really important to think about uh, when legacy data sets are sort of useful and not useful. So um, an example of a low precision uh, social determinant of health would be household income if there's no household size. So, you know, depending on the number of folks who live in a household, a, a, a set household income could mean a great, uh, a wide variety of things in terms of living above or below the poverty level. Um, insurance status, again, is something that's reflected in the medical record. So therefore it is frequently used as a, um, as a stand-in for insurance or for uh, social uh, socioeconomic status, but um, is a very poor proxy for that. Um, often that we think we, we look at social determinants of health and they actually function as risk factors rather than actual determinants of health. And um, that depending on the context could be problematic. It could make those factors uh, not precise for what we're really trying to get at. And then of course, race and ethnicity are socially constructed uh, you know, variables that um, function in a low precision way when we are looking at social determinants of health. Um, so then we can think about higher precision social determinants of health, like household income combined with household size can be a much better um, assessment of the available uh, funds you know, for seeking healthcare, for example. There are measures like child opportunity index, which are based on, um, you know, uh, lots of factors about where a person lives, et cetera. Um, you get the, uh, these sort of directly elicited measures about interpersonal um, discrimination, like this Williams Everyday Discrimination Scale. And then I would uh, encourage everyone to take a look at Phoenix. It has a, a really great selection of social determinants of health and considerations about how to collect this type of data. Uh, but the point for, that I'm making here is that a lot of the legacy data sets only include these low precision options and don't include the higher precision options. 
So how should we navigate the use of race and ethnicity and other social determinants of health when performing secondary data analyses using le uh, legacy data? So uh, I wanna make a distinction between uh, two different ways to utilize social determinants of health in genomics research. Um, there, there's table one uses, which is really um, intended primarily to give a reader a sense of who was in, in the study. Um, sort of like, this is what the context of my study was, or this is what the population that I'm including in this work looks like. Um, and then you've got the actual analyses of the study, you know, reported in the results and discussion section. So um, the, that analysis is intended to answer specific scientific questions. And it, at times, these two might not be identical to one another. So if you think about table one, in the near term, it could be an appropriate place to report race and ethnicity variables and, and other low precision social determinants of health. That's what you have, but exclusively for context, not uh, to include in the analyses. Um, in, in many, kind, many kinds of research questions, these measures are simply too imprecise to be valuable for meaningful, uh, meaningfully answering scientific questions. Um, but in the longer term, because race and ethnicity variables in particular um, have all of the challenges folks have been talking about, that they sort of uh, encourage typological thinking, they're sort of, uh, we attribute biological meaning to them when they don't hold that biological meaning. Um, in the longer term, we need to find ways to describe social context of participants without using uh, concepts that are so reductive. And, um, we, you know, hopefully we'll be able to utilize newer data sources like all of us, like ABCD, to, um, that, that have higher precision social determinants of health and really depend on those. But then when we get to study analyses, in many cases, we're not going to be including race and ethnicity um, or some of these other social determinants of health. And uh, this is, uh, I'm basically kind of reorganizing uh, the findings of the NASM um, group uh, to make a point here. So there, there are some types of scientific questions where they're, they're really genetic similarity focused. And the committee classified these as gene discovery or human evolutionary history. You've got other work where really literally no population descriptors are needed at all. That work, uh, you know, was labeled by the committee cellular and physiologic mechanisms. Then there's uh, the important distinction here between number three and number four. There's work that's focused on understanding the causation of health traits and outcomes. Why is it that people get sick? Why is it that some people have better outcomes than others when they get sick? Um, the committee called this trait prediction complex traits. And then there's work focused explicitly on health disparities, which the committee labeled health disparities with genomic data. So if we look at these in the context of thinking about the role of social determinants of health, for these first two, typically you don't need social determinants of health at all. Um, for number three, um, you typically need environmental variables um, because you're really trying to understand gene by environment interactions. But again, most legacy data sets don't include the kinds of high quality environmental variables that are needed to make those kinds of analyses. Um, instead, you get these sort of low precision things or maybe a variable that seems like you could use it, but it would really be a proxy for the actual concept that's important. And then, um, you know, when you're trying to understand health disparities, it's certainly uh, appropriate to use race and ethnicity there. You, you actually need to use race and ethnicity um, in order to understand or recognize when a health disparity is taking place. But, um, the, you know, up to about the last five years of health sciences research, we see um, basically research showing that there is a disparity, but with no additional variables that would really help the reader understand what's the pathway, that what, what created that disparity, what are the mechanisms. And so when you just show that there is a disparity, but not providing a pathway to address it, you could actually be creating more harm than you are benefit because you're sort of making it look like these are uh, unavoidable um, disparities instead of understanding what brings these about so we can address them. So closing thoughts, um, legacy data often include social determinants of health, and, uh, which is sort of a specific type of environmental variable that's only suitable for inclusion on table one, not for answering specific research questions. Um, for those seeking to do uh, types of research number three and number four, 
um, typically you will have limited legacy data options. And you really need to be very highly selective about which data sources you're using. You might actually have to go hunting to find the right sources that actually include the higher um, precision uh, variables. And then I just want to make the point that most value, the most valuable research is the research that incorporates both number three and number four, not just looking at when a disparity occurs, but also looking at understanding the mechanisms of those disparities so that social action can be taken to address them. Okay, I think that's it for me. Thank you very much, Dr. Brothers. Um, we now proceed to the final speaker in the session. And again, I note that all uh, questions and answers for speakers should be in the Q&A section here so we can address them when they come up. Uh, our last speaker is Dr. Catherine Chow from the Broad Institute, where she's a computational biologist and software project manager and leads the production of the Genome Aggregation Database, a public database of human genetic variation with over 200,000 genome and exome sequences that researchers use to study the genetic basis of human disease. She manages the roadmap for future development and also works in developing quality control pipelines to prepare large exome data sets for downstream analyses. Thank you, Dr. Chow. You may be muted. I mentioned here that Nomad is only possible due to an enormous amount of people. So I wanted to give a quick thank you to everyone involved in the project, in particular, the individuals who've contributed data and to the core Nomad team pictured on the left. So in my very short time today, I'll be going through four things. What is Nomad? How do we infer genetic ancestry? Why do we create genetic ancestry groups and release this data publicly? And I'll add with some limitations and challenges. So first, NOMAD is an open source database that contains sequencing data, primarily from adult onset case control studies and biobanks. At the NOMAD project, we like to say that we are data parasites, which means that we don't recruit samples or sequence data. We opportunistically ingest data from studies that have already generated that data. The core deliverable of NOMAD is the, the uh, aggregate allele frequency information. And a critical component of this is that allele frequency information aggregated across our inferred genetic ancestry groups. So this screenshot here is showing a uh, variance allele frequency across the inferred groups. And this is just an example of a variant page um, from the browser. So I mentioned that these are inferred groups. They're not naturally occurring. We've created them. But so how do we actually do that? As part of the sample quality control process, we run a principal component analysis or a PCA on a subset of high quality variant sites. That PCA will cluster samples based on the genetic similarity between those samples. So on the right, I've included a plot showing principal component one, PC1, on the x-axis, and PC2 on the y-axis. And you can see, for example, that PC2 is separating this green cluster from the other samples. So it's separating samples that look like they have East Asian genetic ancestry from, say, this purple cluster here that's samples that look like they have African genetic ancestry. We use information from this PCA and known ancestry labels to train and run a random forest classifier. And this is how we actually create and assign samples to our genetic ancestry groups. And so what do I mean by known labels? I mean these nine labels here. And these labels were harmonized by um, from study provided metadata, largely from the Human Genome Diversity Project, HDDP, or the Thousand Genomes Project. And so why do we actually create these groups and why do we release them? So we feel that these groups are critical to certain downstream applications of the database. And to, to illustrate that, I've included an example here. So this is a variant in the gene AGA. And when this variant is homozygous in an individual or present in combination with another pathogenic allele, it leads to aspartoglucosaminuria, which is a disease in the Finnish disease heritage. This is the variant, uh, table of the genetic ancestry group information for this variant in the browser. And I want to draw your attention to two lines in this row, in uh, two rows in this table in particular. I know the numbers are a bit small, so I've pulled them out for you here. And I, what I want you to notice is that the allele frequency for this variant is about 240 times higher in our inferred Finnish genetic ancestry group as compared to the non-Finnish European inferred group. And this is a level of information that would be obscured if you looked at frequency information nomad wide, which is what I've highlighted in this box here that's showing the frequency of this variant across the entire nomad data set. So I mentioned that we create these groups using PCA and a random forest classifier. And I wanna spend the rest of my time discussing some limitations of this methodology. 
The first thing that I wanted to highlight here is that our random forest relies on known ancestry labels. And because we do not actually re directly recruit samples, the we at the NOMAD project are entirely reliant on sample metadata provided to us by the various projects. So this means that there's a large amount of availability in the types of sample metadata that are available, how specific they are, and even how they were collected. And we often don't know how the set of sample metadata were collected. And to kind of emphasize that here, for our latest release, NOMAD version 4, we took data from over 300 contributors, which corresponded to over 100 studies from a variety of different countries. So as you can imagine, there was an enormous amount of variability from study to study. Also, for when you create any kind of reference data set, to create the final data release, here I'm showing, again, V4, which has 800,000 individuals. To create this data set with 800,000 individuals, we had to process a lot more samples. So we actually processed over 1 million samples. And so you can imagine that with 1 million samples, there were kind of mountains and mountains of associated sample metadata. If you'd like to get a better sense of how the sample provided, study provided metadata mapped to our inferred genetic ancestry groups, we have a table on our stats page. I know this isn't legible. This is just a plug for the stats page to check that table out if you're interested. So to go one step back from the random forest, I also wanted to highlight that the principal component analysis, PCA itself, is sensitive to the sample composition of your data set. To give an example of this, I've included a table that has our genetic ancestry groups and the sample counts associated with each groups from NOMADS versions two through four. I wanna draw your attention to the line I've highlighted in blue showing the Middle East genetic ancestry group. You can see that in NOMAD v2, we were unable to identify this group, but in NOMAD v3, we had enough samples. I know this is a small amount of samples, but this was enough for the PCA to identify this distinct cluster of samples. Now I wanna draw your attention to the one row beneath this line. So in NOMAD v4, we were unable to cluster, sorry, we were unable to label over 30,000 samples because they didn't clearly cluster with any of the other samples. But you can imagine as we increase the sample set size of NOMAD, and in particular with that sample size increase, increasing the representation of underrepresented or groups that are not represented in the database at all, that we would be able to identify new clusters of samples that we just can't identify with our current uh, data. I also wanted to mention here that genetic ancestry is a continuous metric. You can see it from this PCA plot, the kind of smear of the dots here. So any kind of efforts, including ours, to create discrete groups will be inherently lacking. I also know that I went through a lot very quickly in eight minutes. So I wanted to highlight here that I have wrote a blog post about this covering all of these major points last year. So if you'd like to see a written summary of what I've discussed, I encourage you to navigate to our blog and read this post. And finally, if you'd like to continue the discussion around genetic ancestry outside of this panel, I encourage you to reach out to, to the NOMAD team using our new user forum or to email the team directly at nomad.broadinstitute.org. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And, and now we do have several questions from the chat, um, a couple of which I think could best be answered at book length. So we'll try to get a couple of the easier ones out of the way. Um, so the first question from Dr. Sarah Nelson at UW is, HapMap seems to be a good example of widely used data that are carefully collected with respect to community preferences and population descriptors. However, guidelines and preferences are often not followed. In other words, for example, YRI populations are collapsed as African, et cetera. This may come out in a breakout, but what, what more robust ways do we think we have to make population descriptors guidelines as followed are followed, especially for these widely used public databases? I think that's actually Dr. Rutimi. Yeah, thanks for that question. I That's question has bothered me for many, many years. Um, so researchers and groups that work with HapMap, we went through this trouble of making sure that we properly label samples and this. But in the end, when researchers are using it, they go to their shorthands, the familiar. And, and in fact, it was actually quite annoying to a lot of uh, African communities because what was being presented was like Yoruba is now standing for the whole of Africa. Uh, because when people publish data, they collapse it and use that shorthand African. 
um, in some kind of even say African slash African American. Um, mm. You know, so the the thing here is that we have to find a way to hold ourselves accountable for the things that we do, even when labors are there and properly done through community engagements, we still end up going back to our default and our default that is influenced by funding mechanisms, by political structures, and by just the way we are trained. And, and we just, you know, we are lazy, we use that shorthand and we just go back to that, uh, you know, in a sense, you know. So that's why I went to use the example of the Messiah and the Yoruba in my talk to, to say that when you, when you use African, um, you really are distorting a lot of things. In fact, that ancestry thing that I showed around the world, 21 ancestries, 11 of those ancestries were, were in Africa alone, again, emphasizing the diversity that is there. So I think we really have to be, you know, we have to hold ourselves accountable. I think that's sort of the bottom line here. And, and there's one quick question that I uh, don't think we've had a chance to answer yet. But Dr. Chow, uh, somebody has asked, uh, are, the th are the ancestry groups you were talking about actually self-reported or how ascertained? So that's actually part of the sample metadata variability that yeah. I referenced. We actually don't know. So for some studies, mm. the labels that they provided us were self-provided. Other studies, I think they might have been researchers assigned. But in general, we actually don't have good insight into how the labels were collected. So the, the ones in the table specifically. Apologies if I missed anything. My my headphones started producing weird noises. No, there you go. Many of these have really good answers in in the quick Q and A. Uh, there are a couple that are still unanswered, so I think we're just going to move to those. Uh, Doctor Brothers, are SDOH sometimes needed in discovery GWAS to adjust for confounding? Yeah, this is actually a great question because, uh, I, I mean, something that stays um, implicit in almost all discussions of genomics is that uh, associations between genotype and phenotype are always within a specific context. So you you could say that the all of the environment is at all times a confounder on uh, genotype-phenotype association. So I think the, the answer to this question really goes back to uh, to what extent would you consider an element of the environment a confounder or merely the background upon which we understand an association? So, uh, I, I mean, I can imagine circumstances where you might want to or need to do this in order to really understand what's a real association and what's sort of just like picking up uh, an artifact. But, um, I mean, I think it's, it's critically important that we always remember that uh, there, there are going to be you know, environmental circumstances where a particular genotype brings about a certain phenotype. And, and there are other environmental circumstances where that association is simply not going to happen because, you know, of a million different things, whether there is a particular, uh, you know, contaminant in the environment, whether you're exposed to a certain developmental um, effect or those, all these types of things, uh, stress, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, this is actually a pretty good round robin question, I think, this last one from E.G. Adkins Jackson. Are any of you collaborating with social scientists that have extensively studied these nuances and could be beneficial to developing this science? I had, sorry, I'm from a division of behavioral and social research. I have a fondness for questions like this. Um, if anyone would like to confess to this, that would be, that'd be great. Yes. Let's move on. Uh, uh, Jonathan, this is yes. a this is a step on. I can't turn on my video because you. Oh. Um, I can't either. Well, anyway, so I'm a physician and I study genetics, and I only I work with Louisa Borrell, one hundred percent on everything, and she's a social epidemiologist, and so we don't always agree, but we find where we can agree and agree to disagree on where we d don't agree. So. I think that's been a very beneficial relationship, working relationship. So in other words, even if it doesn't always give you the answer, at least you've asked the question and gotten somewhere on it. I Yeah, and I also want to, wanna, I, I agree with Dr. Rotimi um, about the, there's granularity and with Catherine about the Finnish example, but you know, we we are we are experts. We think about this all the time. So this is on our minds. But 
as I said, the FDA is mandating as of May of 2024 that companies include a diversity plan. And I think as people are who are less familiar with this, they'll just collapse everybody. So going to Charles's point, they'll just collapse what all Africans as one uh, and all Europeans as one. So um, I don't know what the solution is and how to educate um, big pharma, uh, big pu places that are going to need this data. I think, um, that's the one. I think the one of the things is also to educate FDA uh, mm -hmm. to let FDA know that the groups that they may re they may receive yeah. as a result of trying to answer their request may not necessarily make sense. Especially FDA is there for drug development and pharmacogenetics. Uh, that just saying Africans yeah. uh, may indeed be very problematic, um, and they need to be sensitive to that. Uh, like Catherine shown, you know, I was quite happy with the example of the Finnish example again. But you know, even Catherine at the end, you were still saying Europeans. Um, you know, so so it's real, but you show very clearly that using the concept of a European, you could have really done a bad job with that variant. Um, you know, uh, in a sense. So I think we are caught in this pull and push, but we just have to find a way to be consistent. Yeah. And I'm as guilty as the next person, just, just to be clear. <laughs> so I don't have a good question, uh, answer for the, the big pharma question, but for the social scientists, this is something that at the Nomad Project we've been thinking about a bit more. Um, so we engaged with individuals from the Broad Institute's IDEA office. So that's the Office of Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Allyship. Um, so they helped guide some of the thinking around the Genetic Ancestry blog post, and we've been uh, we've reached out to them when we've been thinking about how to do a little bit of finer resolution. So we do have kind of largely continental based groups right now. But as we think about refining the resolution of the information we're able to provide, we're, you know, talking to them about how how to present these labels. And I'll just jump in and say, I think solving these issues is it really requires transdisciplinary work and transdisciplinary work implies not only uh, people from different fields working together, but also uh, people no longer seeing themselves as being in a single field and instead thinking of, you know, like, uh, it's not that uh, we need to find a social scientist uh, in order to sort of advise us, but like our team fundamentally involves people who are experts in genomics and social sciences. Um, you, you've heard some people talk already today, not me, about uh, who, who are these kinds of people who deeply understand social science, deeply understand genomics, and they're able to help bring that together. So I, I think that's really the solution here. It's not just, you know, advising uh, an ethicist when needed. It's really pe people building up a whole collection of expertises. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that for social scientists, uh, I do seek out. Uh, but one of the frustrations for me, though, is that the granularity that we need, uh, Carl, you know, sort of speak to this a little bit. And that is, if you look at the experiment, uh, natural experiment, disastrous natural experiment that took place in Jackson, Mississippi because of the poor water supply and also Flint, Michigan, um, you will see that if you want to understand that process, you really have to understand why is it that a lot of black people decided to live in one community? And why is it that that community was the one that was least funded for water supply? And why is it that a lot of those people are Democrats? You know, why? So you have a lot of layers of things, you know, that needs to play out. But when that crisis happened, I called one of my social scientists and also a friend, and I said, Oh, I'm sorry that you, know, you guys are experiencing this. He's, you know, a, a black person using that concept. You know, he said, Charles, oh, no, it didn't affect me. I don't live in that neighborhood. So if you were using notion of black, you know, and this, you can see how you actually, you still will miss the picture. Uh, at one level, you may get some correlation, but whites in that community also suffered, uh, you know. So it's, I find it that even our social scientists are not able to help us to truly 
separate these things out and give us variables that we can put in models. I think that to me is the challenge. What are the variables that we can truly use to capture, instead of using something like black, where, where the issue may actually be income, may even be political party that you are affiliated with, you know, all those kind of things. I, I think there are many, many challenges, um, you know, again, from social science and also from the geneticists. You know, yeah. This has been a wonderful session and thank you very much for the three speakers who uh, so patiently gave us uh, their opinions on this. Uh, actually, I think we return now to the moderator, uh, Dr. Hindorf, about the breakout groups and getting people where they need to be. Yes, thank you so much. That was a terrific panel and I hope that's gotten everyone's um, juices flowing and ready to discuss. Um, I was asked to share the breakout group instructions one more time. So here they are on the screen. Um, I will remind everyone that when you join your breakout group, you will have 45 minutes to be with your group. Um, everyone should receive a message five minutes prior to the close of the breakout rooms. Um, I'm asking the moderators and the note takers um, for each breakout group to, to make sure that your recommendations are recorded in the Google doc link that I sent out. Um, what I'm going to do when we come back is screen share those slides to keep us all on time um, and to allow every group to share in this um, next, uh, the next session there. Every group will have two minutes to report back. So we need to keep things on time. Um, so I, I apologize in advance if I will need to interrupt you to keep um, um, keep to time. Um, just so everyone knows, the last thing I'm going to say, uh, we're going to start with group eight. Um, so Laura Harris's group will be first, and then we'll go in numerical order if that helps you sort of plan when you're going to be talking if you're a, um, a breakout group moderator. Um, so thank you again. And um, Gerald, I think we are ready to open the breakout rooms. So everyone go forth, have a great time discussing, and we'll see you back in 45 minutes. <laughs>